So yesterday I had this thought, um, what is the one question that a lot of kids are asking nowadays? And this is from, you know, Jordan Peterson talks about it. Gary V talked about it quite a bit. Um, other people talk about it. This concept of is university a scam? Is university education something that is valuable enough in today's society? As you know, if you look at entrepreneurship, you know, you're, you're going to look at people like Mark Zuckerberg or, or Bill Gates or Elon Musk. Elon Musk is a different story because he quit his PhD. So he'd already gotten degrees. Uh, but if you look at Gates and Zuckerberg, they quit in, during their first year. So one thought is, should you actually spend all you know thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars to get a university education? Is it really worth it? Now, take it from someone like me who has an undergraduate degree, a master's degree, and a PhD, right? So after high school, I spent four years uh, doing my undergrad in computer science and engineering honors degree at the University of Texas at Arlington. Then I did my master's degree right away. I didn't work or take a year off, none of that. Right away I started, did my master's in neuroscience at McGill. Um, and then that was three years. And then I spent seven years doing a PhD in neuroscience. So if you are someone who is perhaps you haven't started your career path in terms of your academic career path and you're contemplating, you know, is university worth it? Should you spend all that money? Or if you're someone who already has an undergraduate degree and you're thinking graduate school, PhD, especially for someone who wants to do a PhD in neuroscience or, or psychology or computer science or anything that is a science um, and even other other fields like philosophy and 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 even music and arts and and history even this video will be valuable to you because I'm going to give you my experience and yesterday as at night um, I basically spent uh, you know these all these notes writing down what I'm going to say today and and it's just you know we're, we might go on tangents and I might tell you all these stories but. Um, all stories have a learning lesson, and I'm going to try to give you that learning lesson as much as I can. And I'll also write down on this blank piece of paper what I sort of think about during the video, and then I'll come back to it because I do want to get into all of this. So someone like me, I love to study. All right. So like a, a simple example, like, I don't know, I, I always refer to this book. This is a, a book I'm reading right now, Behave. And a Primate's Memoir I'm reading, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius I'm reading, The Behave and Primate's Memoir by Robert Sapolsky, and I'm reading all the time. I spend maybe three, four, five hours a day reading, and I fucking love to read. And so someone like me who loves knowledge, who is craving, uh, is very curious about the world. I'm curious about my own heart, my own brain, I'm curious about spirituality. I'm curious about how the world works, how the human brain works, right? So when I was doing my undergraduate degree, I took a course called Artificial Intelligence. by it's, It was by Diane Cook, Dr. Diane Cook. She was also my thesis supervisor. So if you can imagine someone like me, as I am doing my undergraduate degree, I have such a thirst for knowledge that I wind up going to Dr. Cook and I ask her, hey, um, I would like to have some kind of job, right? And you don't even have to pay me because, you know, it was it, it was hard for undergraduates to get these research type jobs. And even now it's not that easy. So I went up to her and said, look, whatever you have for me, I can help someone. I can code simple things. I, I, you know, I was a third year student at the time. And she paired me up with this guy, Dr. Gilbert Peterson, and I helped him make very basic modules for his robotics uh, uh, automation uh, project, right? So he basically was teaching a robot how to, with like sonar sensors and like these grippers and really, really cool actuators and stuff. And he was basically teaching this robot how to play miniature golf. So you can imagine like uh, there's like a golf course, you have a golf ball, and then, uh, you, you know, the, the robot can like grip hold the hold the golf ball, put it in the middle, and then boom, it hits the golf ball for the next thing. And then he tries to, you know, he looks at where the hole is, 
He looks at where the ball is. He positions himself right in front of the hole and it hits the ball. So there's a lot of coding involved. And I basically was coding the simplest stuff, right? So like, like how to do the gripping, how, how much to push the ball, uh, how to orient the robot. It was just very, very simple stuff. And as an undergraduate, I was coding this in C. It was so cool to be part of this big project. But keep in mind that if you go and embark on any career and you start by doing a university education, you should have interest in what you're doing, right? Because if you don't have interest, then you will lose when you hit an obstacle. And I'll give you a, a simple example. When I was in my master's degree at McGill with Dr. Angel Alonso, who's a very, very, very good researcher, about a year and a half in, uh, about a year and a half in, he died. Dr. Angel Alonso, may, may peace be upon him, he died. And us, you know, me, the 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 other students, the postdocs, we were left in in complete uh, chaos because it was basically our our scientific father figure who passes away, and he had some like encephalitis, some rare bacterial encephalitis thing. He caught it in near Boston at when he was at Cold Spring Harbor Lab. And he died a couple of weeks after catching this. And, and he collapsed while he was painting. It was just horrible. And we saw Dr. Alonso like with tubes all over his body, right? So you can imagine the, the trauma that I felt as a master's student. I was like, wow, like I was going to do my PhD under this guy. And so just to make you aware that first lesson, right? Lesson number one, you must love what you study. So when I was an undergrad taking this AI course with Dr. Cook, I loved this course. And remember, this is 2003. Okay, 20 years ago, I took AI, machine learning, all these courses. And I was learning how to program chat boss. I was like trying to see if a chat bot would pass the Turing test. You know, right now you look at guys who are doing AI and chat GPT, chat, chat GPT and stuff. I was as an undergrad doing this at the, at the cutting edge way back in the day. Like I feel old when I see people talk about AI, I'm like, shit, I was doing this shit 20 years ago. This is crazy. So I loved, I love computer science. I'm not a programmer because that's not, that's not my calling. So I, you know, I quit programming in the computer science career. But I remember this one course I took, Theoretical Concepts by Manfred Ube. And uh, this course was so magical that I remember staring at the, black, at the whiteboard, the, the chalkboard, and he would be writing this, these like amazing theoretical stuff with like, you know, what a, what a Turing machine looks like and just this epic, epic, really beautiful, sexy computer science. And, and I literally remember at one point I had this realization that I am in heaven. I literally looked at that and I was like, fuck, I understand this stuff so well. My brain feels so good. And it was like nerd heaven for me, right? I felt like I was in heaven. So when I look back at that, you know, 20 years ago, and I think this was 21 years ago, because I was in my third year when I took theoretical concepts, this is something you must remember. So if you, let's say you are a fan of history, right? You really love history. Don't worry if it won't pay you after your undergrad. I'm telling you right now, buddy, do not worry about it. When you go to any sort of education, any book you read, any course you take, anything you study on a serious level, do not care if you're not going to get and some uh, lots of money after your undergraduate degree. That is not something you should care about because that money, searching for money, chasing money will end one day. And there will be so many obstacles that you face during your university studies and during your perhaps master's and PhD, you're going to face more and more and more obstacles. Like for me, my supervisor died. Another obstacle I faced, oh, let me tell you this really cool obstacle when I was at McGill. 
I'm not even supposed to say this, man, because it's like borderline. Uh, you know, I, I'll just tell you. So when I finished my undergrad and I decided to do my neuroscience grad school at McGill, I remember Dr. Vilanur Ramachandran, such an amazing person. Please go read his books, watch his YouTube videos if you haven't done so. He did a lot of studies with phantom limb, phantom limb pain. He, discovered, he did the mirror test where he figured out how uh, to basically alleviate pain in a person who had an amputated hand. The person would think that there is an amp, you know, so, so imagine like I'm looking at you now, right? So imagine this hand doesn't exist. This hand exists, right? So what he would do is he would put a mirror here, right? And while you're looking at the mirror, okay, you're looking at the other hand. But anyway, I'll tell you this later. This is, uh, this could, this could get uh, in detail. I want to write it down and make sure I know this, but go look up the mirror test. It was really interesting. Basically, he used this mirror to make the person think that that they were uh, taking a Q-tip and very, very softly uh, caressing their hand that is amputated. They were literally caressing the hand that was amputated. So, um, oh yeah, yeah, this is what he did. Yeah, this is what he did. I don't remember. So imagine there's a mirror here, okay? And this, this hand is there, but this hand doesn't exist. Right? So I'm taking this out of the way. The other hand, I don't even have pretend, right? So he would take this pen and the person would be looking at the mirror, right? So uh, he would be looking at the, yeah, he would be looking at the mirror and like you're, you're watching this other hand through the mirror, right? So if I'm watching the mirror, I'm watching the other hand because I don't have my right hand. I only have this hand. So I'm watching the other hand. And then what, what uh, Ranmachandran did was took a Q-tip and started very softly caressing this hand, right? And, and, and the person felt alleviation. He felt an ease. He felt uh, a, like a tickling in the hand that didn't exist. And this is how he discovered, you know, how to, how to alleviate phantom limb pain. Just like wonderful, wonderful studies. So again, lesson number one, love what you do. So for me, when I was, in, was, I, when I was a computer science major and I finished my honors degree, I didn't fall in love with computer science, right? I wasn't like fully in love with it because my thought was I should study the human brain because the goal of computer science has always been, or at least one of their goals, you know, you look at neural networks and you look at reinforcement learning and all these things I did in my honors thesis and I actually published it in an artificial intelligence conference, which I went to Spain for and I presented it to all these old people uh, as you know, as, as, what, what I was like 20 at the time, 20 or 21. And uh, so you, so, so if you, so if you, okay, so let's go back to, to what happened. So while I was in my AI class, I was watching Diane Cook do this wonderful artificial intelligence work, right? I, I saw the, the, the theory of it, the practice of it. We coded some programs in Java at the time. And I had this realization that Instead of computer science, which looks at the network, which is our human brain, and tries to make an artificial network out of it, something that we can study, something that we can model, why don't I actually go and study the human brain itself? And that's when, during my three months of summer break, I studied Villanur Ramachandran. I saw the Wreath Lectures from 2003. Please go watch that. If, you're, if you want to understand how cool neuroscience is, go watch the Wreath Lectures by Villanur Ramachandran. And I just sent him an email where... Uh, replying back and forth. What what an amazing human being, just an amazing human being. And his Indian accent is so thick and so strong and so intense. It's just amazing guy. So I decided that I'm going to study um, the human brain. And this is another lesson that you need to, to learn. It's okay to switch. This is the second lesson. So if you, and, and this used to happen to me a lot, people would come up to me and be like, wait, uh, what, what is your PhD in? Neuroscience. What did you study before that? Well, I did my master's in neuroscience. Oh, cool. So you, you did a grad degree in neuroscience. What about your uh, undergrad degree? Computer science. And you're like, what? I mean, I mean, this is like 15, 16 years ago. So you can imagine that the, I mean, nowadays, obviously computer scientists do neuroscience stuff all the time because it's computational neuroscience. It's the mathematical form of neuroscience or the neuroscientific form of math. 
And so there's a lot of modeling going on. I mean, all the stuff that that deep learning is doing and all the stuff that Neuralink is doing and 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 Google is other Google uh, projects are doing. All of this is looking at neuroscience from a computational perspective. That was my PhD. And so when we look at the ability to switch careers, and, and let me get into uh, this really funny story that happened when I switched. So I get to McGill. I have basically zero uh, chemistry training, zero organic chemistry, barely took a, a, a I mean, I took AP biology. So I, I got like, a, I, I passed the first year biology because I got a good grade on my AP test. Um, in, in undergrad, I basically did no chemistry courses, no biology courses because I passed the AP. Um, I, I, did, um, I did physics. I did a lot of physics and math and all that stuff because that was computer science stuff or, or math related, right? Uh, uh, hardcore analytical science related. But, um, but the, 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 the transformation or the graduation from computer science to neuroscience was hard because McGill had this rule. They said, if you are a master student, you got to have organic chemistry. You got to have organic chemistry too. You got to take chemistry. You got to take biology. It was like a like two years of courses that I would have had to take. And this is something uh, I'm going to teach you too. Uh, seek forgiveness, not ask permission. Um, this is something we can get into uh, very soon. So, um, so then. Obviously, I didn't want to take these courses, and it was uh, annoying for me because they said that I am not allowed to do this registration unless I take these two years of, of science courses, like natural science courses. And I was like, fuck no, there's no way I'm doing that. So I found some hack, you know, computer science. I found some hack in their online app called Minerva. And I figured out how to register for these courses without having the prerequisites. That was awesome. So I basically uh, did, I took the master's course. Uh, I took Alzheimer's disease and I took a, a course, another course that was a graduate course. And both of these courses had, um, they had a very intense, un, uh, a very intense prerequisites, but I didn't take them. So I go, I, I, I enroll in these courses, and halfway through the midterms have happened, right? The first exams have happened, and I've aced both exams in both courses. And so uh, I get an email from the dean of neuroscience, right? The 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 director, um, what was her name? I don't remember, but I get an email from her, and she's like, "Wait, I just found that you." are in our grad school, you are in first year grad school, and you are taking these two courses, but you have no none of the prerequisites. And I'm like, oh, fuck, I got caught. So I uh, uh, went up to my two professors, like Andre, uh, Andrea LeBlanc was one of them, and, and the other one I don't remember, and uh, I said, can you please send me the exams that I just took, the midterm exams with my grade? And I got those, and I emailed that straight to the dean. And I'm like, look, I don't need the prerequisites. I got A's already. And then she's like, okay, fine. It's all good. You can take it. So the learning lesson from this is seek forgiveness. And don't ask for permission. This is something I learned from RSD Todd when I was uh, in Vegas and I was doing this, um, uh, you know, picking up girls and, 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 and helping him uh, assist in his boot camps. And, and it, it was some crazy stuff, but Basically, my job was to uh, film and, 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 you know, him pulling girls to, to his house and, and, and into hotel rooms. And one time he banged some girl at like Surrender Nightclub, like right there. And I was filming that and, and so on. So he taught me one time that, Farhan, it's better to seek forgiveness than to ask for permission. So in this, um, and I hadn't met him at that time, so I didn't know this phrase, but basically I learned that don't always go around asking for permission because you may just hear the word no. But if you do it and you do it really, really well, and then if you fuck something up and you're like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, you do two steps forward, one step back, you say, oh, I'm sorry, More, most likely you're going to be good because what they found, if, if there's a book where the nurse um, looked at all the people who were on their deathbed in hospice or, you know, wherever she was, 
yeah, so 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 I learned that if you um, if you do something really, really well, you can always say, I'm sorry and 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 everything will be okay. Because like I was talking about the nurse, uh, this nurse who wrote a book about, I think it was like a hundred and something people or hundreds of people who were on their deathbed. And she basically asked them, what is your biggest regret? And they wrote down a bunch, there was a bunch of rankings. Like, like one of the top was, um, I regret that I didn't uh, spend enough time with my family, or I regret that I lived life for other people and not myself. You know, there's all these regrets and these people are dying. So we have a lot, they have nothing to lose, right? They're, they're about to die. So we can learn a lot from people like that, from senior citizens like that. So anyway, uh, so, so one thing that I learned from this book is that usually we regret doing things. Uh, we regret not doing things. We rarely regret doing things. I mean, it does happen. It does happen. If there's like repercussions or very negative things, then you will regret doing th things. But usually, especially on the deathbed, people regret not doing things. So I highly recommend that if you are, if you really want to go to university, if you really love uh, studying something for the next four years in university, and it's like, like if you if you look at homework, right? Things like homework. And I remember, let me tell you how crazy I was in undergrad. I would finish the problem sets, you know, the homework, the quiz, um, and I would print out problem sets from MIT. There's this professor, Dr. Uh, Sebastian Sung. I would print out his problem sets and I would try to do those problem sets. They were hard. They were really, really hard. But I did them because I was so obsessed with getting the best grade, learning as much as I could, solving those, those uh, problem sets, uh, doing the assignments. But I wasn't like some genius at it. Even though I remember in my undergrad, as a first year student, grad students would come up to me and they would be like, hey, Farhan, are you, oh, be like, are you Farhan? Are you uh, uh, the Farhan? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh my God, I've heard so many things about you. You like shake my hand. I'm like a first year student and this guy's a grad student. But people had heard about me because I would be getting, you know, 90s on exams when the the curve, the, the average was like a 30, right? So people had heard about me. So I was like, like a popular kid in school uh, because everyone cared about doing amazing. And especially the Indians who were there from, you know, with H1B visas and they had to do good in, in, in university because, or in grad school, because they wouldn't get a job or they'd get deported back to India. So it was great. I still remember my Indian friends who would come up to me and it's like, Farhan, I can't believe that you went and got an American high school education. This is so weird because the most of the Americans we know who got a, a high school education in America like they are so dumb and they, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. And they have such a stupid idea about the world. And, and I was like, fuck, like, man, this is the sort of, um, this is the, the nature. This is the, the impression that Amer American high schools have had on the rest of the world. Cause the, the high school education is so bad. And, and for sure, this is true because both of my parents, uh, you know, before they retired, they were high school uh, educators and man, like, Fuck, it's uh, they, they told me some horror stories. Um, and, and me obviously being in high school, I, I know how the education system was. But one thing I'll tell you is that uh, when you are doing your undergraduate degree, if you are, try to do study abroad programs, try to do exchange programs as much as you can and gain this knowledge of different cultures. Because I remember this, this is sort of a sad story, but during my undergrad, I think it was second year, because I was part of the Honors College, we had this opportunity to go to Prague for one month, right, for 30 days, and it was like $100 all-inclusive, right? So food, rent, um, uh, like they took care of like our, our bus tickets and, and, and museums, like they took care of the whole thing, all-inclusive for $100. And the reason I couldn't go is because at that time uh, we had a, some kind of like immigration thing where, you know, I didn't have papers. And if I had left the U.S., I would like not be able to come back for 10 years. It was just really, really bad. So I couldn't go on this uh, on this trip, unfortunately. And then things worked out. And, you know, I, I, I you know, in terms of America, everything worked out. We got our papers handled. But 
But at that time, I had this crazy opportunity to go to Prague and God knows what would have happened. And during my undergraduate degree and, and, and before that, I was you know not leaving the U.S. It was like I was basically trapped in the U.S. from 1991 to 2003. For 12 years, I didn't leave the U.S. And leaving the U.S. allowed me to learn that the U.S. is not the only country in the world. So this is something really, really, I, I recommend you travel. Look, if you're into spirituality, you read Marcus Aurelius or you read Seneca, they always say, fuck travel, right? Like everything you have is here. If you travel, uh, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna find something external, but everything you have is inside you. And I do resonate with that. But I also know from reading Sapolsky behave that there's gene environment interactions where your genetics, uh, your DNA, it's methylation and demethylation where the genes turn on and off. And, and this happens through epigenetics and your sperm can change through your actions, right? So if you're a man and you are, let's say, working out or you are traveling or you are getting educated, your sperm can change through those actions in life. And then that sperm will obviously impact your future kids. So don't just think that, oh, I'm born with these genes. My kids will have these genes. No, no, no. The nurture, the, the environment, how that interacts with your genes has a huge, huge role in what happens uh, to your kids to, and to your grandkids, obviously. So travel. I uh, highly, highly recommend that you do your best to get out of your comfort zone as early as possible. Go backpacking. I didn't do any of that shit, man. I didn't backpack through Europe. I'm probably going to do it with my girlfriend uh, uh, you know, God willing, uh, uh, soon. Um, and then we'll have fun doing that stuff. But if you can do it as a teenager, go explore, you know, take a little bit of risk, uh, obviously like be smart in what, what happens, but, but put yourself out there, man, really, really put yourself out there. Nowadays, if you look at, um, how the world is, uh, especially, uh, um, through social media and, and Tinder and all this crap, we get this tendency to sort of stay introverted, not get out of our shell, not be vulnerable, not be transparent, not be truthful. But I'm going to tell you right away, you have to be fully truthful, right? doesn't matter what your age is. I highly, highly recommend you live a life of truth and you don't ever try to filter what you have to say. Just say it, you know, be truthful, just like I'm doing to you right now. Like I, I may say something to you that I shouldn't say, shouldn't say, but if it's the truth, I'm not going to care. So I would say definitely travel as much as you can. Um, now, now let's get back to um, what is happening in the world today. If you look at people like Jordan Peterson, right, or Gary V and others, they'll always say that the universities are failing, right? All the universities out there are really, really failing. Uh, they have a left agenda and they try to make pussies out of people, you know, the, the politically uh, uh, correct uh, uh, terminology or pr politically correct speech has to happen. Uh, even comedians like Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock and Seinfeld and all them, they're always like, oh shit, I don't want to do comedy at college campuses because there's like this woke, uh, wokeism and, and, and this is like bullshit and people get canceled and, and so on and so forth. Right. But, but then you have guys like Jordan Peterson who are starting the Peterson Academy. And I think it's starting very, very soon, maybe even this month. And Peterson Academy is, is this four year program where I think you pay like $4,000 and you get a accreditation. This, they're trying to get accredited like a, a real four-year university. And, and then, you know, you get lectures on Nietzsche and liberal arts. And let me tell you another thing. Uh, this is something really cool. Science versus liberal arts. This is huge, man. So as a science person and a math person during my undergrad and my master's and my neuroscience PhD, I was very much a uh, 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 nerding out the science, right? I, I wasn't reading history. I wasn't reading fictional novels. I, dude, I finished Crime and Punishment last month, like in last gen, this basically January, 2023, I finished Crime and Punishment and I read it like, tw tried to read it twice before. And I always like, fuck, this is so hard to read. It's so, it's making me feel so, so much anxiety and I quit. And then finally, 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 I think it took me like six months to finish it, but I, I finally finished last month. Um, and, and, and fiction, novels, I highly recommend you read because you will get an idea of 
the truth that is beyond nonfiction truth. So if you look at um, Jordan Peterson, he's the first person who taught me that fiction is more real than nonfiction. And that is because the stories that these amazing artists, this, these amazing novelists and, and authors tell, they encompass the entire universal truth in one story, right? If you look at like hero's journey stories, you look at uh, Harry Potter books and movies. I've only seen the, the movies. I read a little bit of the first book, but if you look at that, it's a, it's a billions of dollar empire and it's the, it's the most sold novel ever in the history of the world. So that hero's journey, that those myths, those, you know, a hero goes on a journey, goes on an adventure, that type of thing resonates so much with uh, um, uh, uh, the human, the human mind, the human condition, the human brain, right? The human heart. So if you are hardcore into science, I highly recommend you, you balance that with liberal arts. I know some of you who have Indian parents and Chinese parents and maybe hard Pakistani parents like I had. I was encouraged to just focus on science. Like, oh, reading novels is like for, for, for girls or it's like a, a, a something that will, will take you away from the money. It will take you away from real world stuff. But a liberal arts education is crucial, man. Because after my PhD, this is uh, 10 years ago when I graduated, I graduated 2013, I basically have spent the last 10 years of my life getting back the liberal arts education, right? Reading Dostoevsky, reading Solzhenitsyn. Uh, uh, I, I did fashion design for six months in New York. I took so many acting classes. I did acting classes in Kiev. I did it uh, uh, in, in uh, Toronto. I did uh, improv classes. I did a bunch of stuff online. The, the guy who taught Cameron Diaz how to act, you know, he's the guy who trained me. So there is so much uh, uh, liberal arts, so much creative, so much feminine energy that I missed during my education, during my, you know, 14 year education after, after high school. So I recommend have a true balance uh, with liberal arts and science. I still remember my undergrad first day. This is uh, uh, 19, uh, 19, no, uh, two, two thousand, 1999, I graduated high school. So this was, um, uh, yeah, 1999, August when I was at UTA, uh, starting my computer science degree. I remember there was a dude. Uh, so, so we all, uh, had to take a math test. You know, we all took a math test. I think I was the only one who made a hundred on the math test. It was super easy. So, you know, you just get an idea that I took a math test without studying for it and I aced it. Why? Because I had studied my ass off for these types of things, right? So if you are not into studying math and you don't love studying math, don't do an undergrad in math. If you don't love history, don't do an undergrad in history. Do what you fucking love. So I remember that first day in undergrad, they asked us, which one of you are computer scientists? Which one of you are mathematicians, you know, or doing the, doing the degree, not mathematicians. Which one of you are doing a degree in math, doing a degree in computer science, doing a degree in biology. And then they said, who is doing a degree in history? There was one guy. One guy raised his hand and said, I am a history major. And we all laughed at him because this guy is a loser. He's going to work at Wendy's when he graduates. It doesn't matter because doing what you love and taking a chance at what you love, you don't know where you will end up. You look at Dr. Eric Kendall, who won the Nobel Prize in neuroscience, in, in, philo in uh, medicine, in physiology and medicine. His undergrad was in literature. And there are many stories like that. So I would recommend that um, you balance out liberal arts and your science and math and analytical education. Really study history, man. You got to study history. I have a really shitty history background, shitty, shitty history knowledge and education. So I had to learn on my own about Holodomor, which is the, the, the famine that Ukraine went through, that Stalin put Ukraine through and, and, and anywhere from two to six million, depending on who you read, Ukrainians died. 
right? I had to learn about the gulag where the Stalin and these guys who imprisoned people and, and, and so many people were, were just wrongly accused and interrogated. I'm reading Gulag Archipelago now. I'm, I'm like, there's three volumes. They're 2,000 pages. I'm on the first volume. It's 700 pages. And I've just finished like page 210 or something like that. I read like four pages a day. It's so hard to read. So I'm catching up on my history. I'm watching a lot of Noam Chomsky to learn about politics um, as much as I can. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best uh, nowadays. So have a balance between liberal arts and, um, and, uh, and, and science. Something I want to touch about gene environment interactions. So if you are born into a family that is an artsy family, right? Like you have a musician uncle, you have an author dad, you are most likely going to end up in that field, right? Like my dad's a doctor. He's an anesthetist. Um, my uncle is a psychiatrist, right? So I have some medical stuff in my family, even though I'm the only PhD, I'm the first person in my family to get a PhD. My dad was the first person in his village in Kulna to get an, a, a medical degree, right? An MBBS, which is like the MD equivalent in Pakistan. So, um, so I would say that your environment will dictate what happens to you. So take advantage, right? Like LeBron's kid is doing amazing at basketball, right? Shah Rukh Khan's kid already started, you know, he was in Kabi Kushi Kabi Gum acting. Uh, Shah Rukh Khan is a Bollywood actor, go look him up. And his kid already started acting as, as, as a child. And so there is that advantage you have over the rest of the world when you are um, you know, like Robert Downey Jr. and and his uh, dad, right? There's all this, uh, um, there's all, or just Charlie Sheen and Martin Sheen, right? There's all this uh, um, advantage you have, a competitive advantage, very unfair advantage you have over people. So if you are fortunate enough and lucky enough and you have a family in this, so go all out, become the best at that. But if you want to, explore something else, do something very different from your fa what your family did. You have to be in the environment to allow those genes to turn on, right? You have so much potential. You have so much, uh, there's so much love and, and so many gifts in inside your heart that you can share with the world. The way you're going to do that is by being in an environment that can turn those genes on and turn other genes off. So if you look at Gopal, Gopal was a really good friend of mine in undergrad. He was an older guy, but he was taking courses with us. He was teaching us stuff. And he told me, he's like, Farhan, when I went to MIT, I saw everyone studying. And I was like, damn, if every student is studying when you look around, then obviously you're going to also want to study. Because the, the environment will dictate what you end up doing in life. And for those of you who have toxic environments, you want to get educated, you want to do uh, advanced studies, and you really, really don't have that encouraging environment, then I have one for you. Go on Facebook right now, type in Afro D Nation, A-P-H-R-O dash D Nation. And Afro D Nation is a group that I started about five years ago. It has about 11,000 people and we encourage each other. We help each other out. We, we, we love each other. We, we show each other workouts and uh, what supplements we're taking. You know, we were vulnerable. We, we, we post selfies and flexes and, and we, we talk about like our transformations and how much weight people have lost. And it's really, really the best online community in the world. So go go get to that community if you want that gene environment interaction to be good. Um, <clears throat> oh yeah, let me tell you how I got an internship at Nortel. So if you are an undergraduate and you are wondering how you can get an internship, do something for free and defy your parents. So I remember when I was trying to get an internship uh, I was in my first year, I was like, fuck it. You know, the worst that can happen is I'm going to go to some interviews and I'm going to fail, right? They're just not going to give me the internship. So I would go and I would like ace the interview. And then at the end, the girl would like give me some weird question. And I'm like, 
I have no idea, but I'll try it. And then I would like do it in a very fucked up way. And then she'd be like, have you taken this course? I'm like, nope. And she'll be like, oh, um, what year are you? I'm like, oh, I'm in my first year. She's like, what the fuck? So like, um, <laughs> I guess she hadn't read my transcript or, or paid attention to my resume at all before the interview. But these interviewers would think like I'm about to graduate, but I was only in my first year and I hadn't taken all the coursework. So they basically said, come back later, come back later. And then I remember I went up to uh, um, uh, uh, Victor Govinda Swami, awesome guy. I think he's teaching at UT Austin now. Last time I checked, he was at UT Austin teaching. He was there, I believe, as like a lecturer or something like that at UT at the time. Really good guy. And I went up to him. I'm like, look, Victor, I'm an undergraduate. I'm a first year. I am unable to get any uh, uh, internships at all. It's hard. So he's like, go work for free. Go. And then he told me, go to Diane, Diane Cook, you know, the one I went to that I told you earlier. Go up to her. Ask that. Ask her that you're going to work for free. Get, put you on any project. Doesn't matter what it is. Just, just do it for your CV. I'm like, all right. So I went up to my parents. I'm like, mom and dad. Um, I have this idea that uh, I'm, I can get an internship, I can program and learn uh, practical stuff, but um, I'm going to do it for free. And man, they were pissed. You have to have the balls to say fuck you to your parents. I'm telling you, man, you got to have the balls, but not in a mean or some ego way. You got to say fuck you to them in a nice, with a smile, like fuck you, mom and dad, fuck you. And you don't have to say the word fuck you, but you basically say, look, I'm going to do this and no matter what, because I know that Victor Govinda Swami, Dr. Victor Govinda Swami, is smarter than you guys at everything that I want to do in the future. So no, I'm not going to listen to you. So uh, so he told me, go do uh, this thing. So I went up to Dr. Koch. She gave me this internship. Um, I, uh, you know, nobody knew it was free, by the way. And you got to shut the fuck up. You let people assume you're getting paid. And then when I went to um, uh, Nortel, Nortel Networks, which was like the top company at the time, it, their stock was like around 100, it was like 92, I think. And then they, they fucked up and fell during the dot-com and then the, the telecom uh, bubble bus busting. Um, so Nortel was the number one company that like everyone wanted to work for. I did an interview with them. I told Randall Murray, who was my boss at the time, the manager, I told him, look, um, I, uh, you know, I've done this work. I helped a PhD student with his PhD. Um, he won PhD, uh, project of the year, right? He won that award. And, uh, so he gave me the, the internship and all the people were jealous, right? I was the guy who got the internship at Nortel Networks. And then how did I get a job at IBM? So it wasn't a job. It was a, it was an internship. Oh yeah. No. How to say no. This is a big one. So when I was an undergrad, uh, uh, I finished my internship at Nortel. It was like a five month internship for four month internship. Um, it was supposed to be longer, like a year or six months to a year. But, um, what happened is Nortel went to shit. They, they went bankrupt. So while I was at Nortel, I had this friend Chuk Wuma on Winemi, awesome guy. Uh, we were at UTA together and he was working at IBM. So he told me, Farhan, why don't you interview with my a group and we are looking for tech support people and you know people uh, to do, do installations of networks and uh, install uh, uh, Linux uh, and uh, um, uh, install like uh, you know stuff on the IBM servers and 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 this type of easy shit you know like uh, IP uh, uh, networking setups and it was like troubleshooting helping people out install software it was easy shit but I didn't know what the inside of a computer looked like. Imagine my dumb shit education at UTA. They never taught us like opening a computer and like, you know, installing memory, like the basic stuff. I had no idea. So I went to Fry's Electronics in Dallas with my brother. My interview was on a Monday. We went on a Saturday. We bought a bunch of computer parts. And during that weekend, I figured out how to put memory in, put memory out. I did it like 20 times. I would put it in, you know, put it in, take it out, put it in, take it out how a hard drive works, you know, how to put in a hard drive. I learned like the whole fucking thing. And then I had the interview on Monday. He told me, uh, you know, the, 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 I don't remember my, my supervisor's name, but he was an awesome dude. He's like, Hey, uh, I, I just doing, uh, you know, change the, the memory here. 
And I did it. I was like, fuck, I did it. It was so cool. And I think that was like most of the interview. And I got the internship, right? So I took a chance at making a fool of myself, not really knowing how to do tech support, but I knew I could learn fast. I knew I'm smart. And so I figured out how to do the memory stuff. I, uh, um, I had a very, very, very successful, my, my eyes just have some light because of the light shining at me uh, with the camera lights. Um, I had the most amazing one year at IBM and they offered me a job and I said no. I still remember I had a, a, one of my mentors at IBM. He was like four or five years into IBM. He was my mentor. We would talk a lot. And I was the youngest person in the group. Um, I was also not drinking at the time. And you know, I don't drink anymore. But then I had a four-year stint of when I was drinking a lot. But at that time, I wasn't drinking. I had barely had a single drink in my entire life. And so everyone would be drinking. I would be like, no. So I would like the little kid who always said no to, to alcohol. And that mentor, he came up to me and he's like, Farhan, I've, I've heard that you decided to say no to a job offer. He, they offered me like 80K. And that's at that time, 80K US in 2000. Two thousand two, two thousand three. That's when I started grad school, and I had already decided I was going to do grad school. I, there was like no way I was not going to go to grad school, and, and and this is a secret that not many people know. I went to grad school to become smart. It wasn't like yes, I love neuroscience, I love studying the brain, I love reading, I love knowledge, I love studying, but it wasn't like I I I didn't want to like say oh I'm going to. Uh, grad school to like become a professor. I didn't want to have like that outcome independent uh, outcome dependence. So I said, you know what? I'm going to uh, PhD. I, I'm going to grad school, a master's PhD, to become smart. That was it. To train my brain to be able to learn anything I can later. And this is something that the PhD or anything that you do deeply does help you with. If you become an entrepreneur, let's say you quit. Uh, university or you 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 drop out of high school or whatever you become an entrepreneur become really fucking good at what you do become really fucking good become like a mr beast because then you will be able to become an expert at something and provide real gifts to the world real real gems to the world so that's how i uh um that's how i got my internship at ibm and um uh, let me just look at my notes. Um, yeah, so I, I talked about that. Um, I talked about that. Yeah. Uh, uh, feeling. This is very, very important. Gut feeling. Look, I'm an EM, I'm an ENTP. I, uh, I kind of go back and forth between ENTP and ENFP. But I'm an ENTP, more or less. But, but like uh, not so deep into the T. But I'm a very uh, big time ex uh, 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 extrovert. I'm very intuitive and I'm very perceptive, right? But the thinking, it's like, you know, 50-50 thinking feeling. But at that time, let me breathe uh, out fully. At that time, I was um, very much a thinker. I was actually very much a thinker until maybe like three or four years ago. So what I want you to do is I want you to get a feel for what you're going to do. So if you are considering that university might be a scam, they might be just trying to take your money because look, man, I, I was lucky enough. I had the Gates Millennium uh, Fellowship. I also had the Aga Khan Scholarship. Uh, so I had my basically undergrad paid full. I also had... Uh, scholarships in my in my master's and PhD so I didn't really have to pay much um, I just had to pay a little bit I was also working at the lab full-time uh, at the Montreal Neurological Institute um, and so I was pretty much taken care of right and my parents are always you know always had my back uh, at the end of the day even though we had a lot of uh, problems and, and and issues and I did make a video about resent for parents which will come out soon as well or maybe it already came out you, you can check it out resent for parents uh, is sort of the, the topic. Um, but I want you to try to have a sense of how you feel about things, right? So try to sit down, close your eyes,
and feel, do you want to go and do something? And again, remember, it is always okay to transition. It is always okay to switch from no, transitions. That sounds like a, a trans, trans, uh, trans. Uh, but like, it's always okay to change from math to physics, from physics to biology, from history. Like, it's okay to change your mind. Don't be in this thought that, oh, I did this, so I have to do this my entire life. Don't be like that. You can switch, man. You can change careers. You can change degrees. You can do a lot of that. Don't be stuck somewhere that you hate. You can change jobs too. Um, yeah. All right. So, um, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I talked about my business education in, in the past, so I won't get into that so much. Uh, oh, another thing about the PhD. If you have to ask yourself, should I do a PhD or not? Should I go to grad school or not? More likely, the answer is don't go. Because you are not sure, you probably shouldn't go. Because for me, I was 110% sure that I was going to do grad school. And hence, I finished it. All the obstacles that came in my way, I passed them. I got through them somehow with the help of my peers, with the help of the world. Thank God. Uh, uh, you know, I got also, I was very fortunate to be in that environment where I was able to overcome all those obstacles. You're going to have to sacrifice. This is a big one. Let me talk about sacrifice. In order for you to really do something worthwhile, to really try to give a gift to the world, you have to sacrifice basically everything. But you can have balance in your life and not sacrifice shit. So if you are the type of person and you want to win the Nobel Prize, you want to become a billionaire, you want to have a very successful brand, you're going to have to sacrifice a shit ton. Man. That's how life is. You're going to have to sacrifice social media. Like, don't go on it. Don't hurt your brain by going on social media. You're going to have to sacrifice, you know, your, your porn addiction. You have to get rid of that. You're going to have to make... Uh, time for the gym and 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 get fit like meaning sacrifice your ego and your uh, uh you know your your toxic ego trying to tell you that you don't need to go work out or you don't need to eat healthy you need to um try to get a sense of what your priorities are and go do them hardcore and again ask yourself what gift can you give to the world oh let me talk about uh, um uh, Rene Dijkstra. Oh, awesome guy. I think he might be, might have passed away by now. Rene, I love you, man. So Rene Dijkstra, Professor Dr. Rene Dijkstra is the guy who discovered the shortest path algorithm. The shortest path algorithm in computer science is where you have a bunch of nodes and you have all these connections and it is, it's a mathematical algorithm, an equation that gets you from one node to the other in the shortest path. It was such a beautiful elegant solution that Rene Dijkstra came up with. And one of his graduate students asked him, Dr. Dijkstra, what should I do for my thesis? What should I focus on for the rest of my, you know, five to seven to eight years of PhD? And Dr. Dijkstra said, son, do that only, do, do what? Only you can do and nobody else. So this is a question I want you to ask yourself. What is something that you are uniquely designed and created to give that gift to the world? What is that? And then go embark on that. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. For those of you, I'm almost done with it. For those of you who are addicted to making A's, and this is something that I was always addicted to. Seth Godin, in a video, such a beautiful video, Seth Godin is this marketing god. He said, those of you who made A's in your life, may God be with you. Because you're going to have to spend so many years trying to get that trauma, trying to get that, that strict tyranny out of your head. And good luck, son, because that type of rewiring is going to be damn difficult. 
So if you are one of those people who's a stickler for making straight A's, as I used to be, I still am, <laughs> I have learned to let things go. I have learned to live a healthy life, to live a balanced life. Like today, I woke up at 3 a.m. Usually, I don't. Uh, like yesterday, I woke up at 4.12. The, the day before was 4.42. So I try to wake up around 4 a.m., but sometimes it's 5, sometimes it's before 4, sometimes it's even after 5. But it's never after 6. I don't remember the last time I woke up after 6. Like that's rare. And that's like the whole week. So now I have, through a very disbalanced, unbalanced life for basically my entire life, I came to a position in my career where I was able to live a balanced life and get a personal trainers, you know, run a company that's men's health company. So me being fit, me being healthy, me learning about men's health actually helps me make money. It helps me grow. And for those of you who are interested, my company is called Afro D. You can go look that up and you can join Afro D Nation on Facebook and you can, you know, add yourself for free, meet all of our customers if you'd like. Um, how to st how to think about not yeah okay so that's fine um yeah that's that's basically the podcast um I, I i basically covered everything i wanted to cover thank you so much and also if you have any questions about um undergraduate degree master's degrees phd if you're confused you're in university right now maybe you have a hard time making straight a's you want to maybe a video on how to make a's how to focus um i mean Besides adding yourself to the Facebook group, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, I highly recommend Cal Newport's book, Deep Work. Cal Newport is a gangster in this stuff, how to, how to you know, basically get rid of social media, live in the real world, um, you know, basically uninstall all that shit and, and turn off your notifications and, you know, look at Tristan Harris. He's, he wrote the, uh, he made the movie Social Dilemma. Um, he has an amazing podcast. I think it's called... Um, Um, what is it called? Time well spent. Time well spent, I believe it's called. Um, so yeah, go look that up. There's a lot of amazing knowledge out there. Look into your heart. See what your heart is calling for. You know, go outside in nature. Get up in the morning. Go see the sunrise. Um, go, go. You know, be outside during the day. Get the sun. Work out. Do breath work. Really pay attention to your health. Don't be obese. There's no excuse for being obese. You got to be fit, man. Um, you, you know, give love to your family, to your friends, to yourself, uh, a walk in nature, breathe. You know, I am always doing this because I'm always trying to breathe from my nose. I even tape my mouth while I go to sleep so I don't breathe from my mouth. And, and, and nasal breathing is really, really cool. I've been doing it for like the last 10 days, hardcore, very, very overtly, very volitionally. So I recommend you, you know, get healthy, uh, you know, get love, uh, put yourself out there, take risks, go travel, um, you know, seek forgiveness, don't ask for permission. And yeah, man, that's what I had to say. Comment below. Let me know what your questions are. If you have a very unique story that you um, went through in your educational career, or if you disagree with me, please let me know if you disagree with me, because I, I would really welcome people who disagree, because then we can have a debate, we can have a conversation. And if you like this video, you know, hit the like button, share it with your friends um, and so they can also get value and learn from it. And, uh, and yeah, subscribe to the channel so you can get notifications for future videos. This is Doc Farhan. Thank you so much for listening and I will see you later. Love you.